there. Well, here I am on holiday on the sunny Croatian coast, and as I explained in my last video, because there's no rest for the wicked, I thought I'd just make a couple of quick videos. The last one was about leaders and whether or not we need leaders. And this video is about 10 very disturbing Bible verses. Um, in fact, I, I really struggled to get the list down to 10. I just thought 10's a nice round number. But inevitably when you, when you do research along those lines, you come across lots of um, appalling examples of, of very, very bad morality and very, very poor ethics in the Bible and I, I just had to kind of focus on getting it down to 10. So these are the 10 verses that made the grade and we will kick off in the book of Genesis at Genesis 19 verses 6 to 8. Then Lot went out to them to the doorway and he shut the door behind him. He said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Please, here I have two daughters who have never had sexual relations with a man. Please let me bring them out to you for you to do to them whatever seems good to you. But do not do anything to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. So we have a situation in which Lot decides that given a scenario in which he has visitors who are angels, um, the best scenario, if those angels are in danger from a mob outside, is to offer this mob his daughters to be gang raped. Now hopefully I don't need to explain how outrageous and appalling and disgusting this is, but just to help put this in perspective, in the latest regional convention series, which I'm calling the worst convention ever, one of the dramas is about Hezekiah, and it focuses on a story in which the Bible describes one angel, one angel um, killing 185,000 Assyrian troops. So one angel killing 185,000 Assyrian troops. Now I don't happen to believe that really happened. I think that there was more likely a, a rational, logical reason why the Assyrians failed in their siege of Jerusalem. But if you want to believe that, or if, let's put it another way, if you take the Bible literally, you have to believe that it was a good decision for Lot to prioritize the safety of two angels who had that capability. Two angels who, if they wanted to, could have annihilated the entire population of that city of Sodom and Gomorrah by themselves. And yet Lot is prepared to see his daughters, or allow his daughters to be gang raped. I mean, even if the angels were uh, vulnerable, uh, even if you make the argument that for some reason these were different angels and they had different powers, they may be specialised in another area other than killing soldiers or killing people. Even then, it's just not acceptable to offer your daughters... To, well, it's not acceptable to offer anyone to be gang raped at all, you know? No one. It's never an acceptable scenario for, for there to be rape of any kind. And yet, here is Lot. Uh, offering his daughters and he ends up being the good guy in the story his wife ends up getting turned to salt as we all know for looking in the wrong direction for daring to go against the angels orders that they're not that they weren't even to look at the city they were fleeing and she gets turned to salt but lot who was happy for his daughters to be gang raped ends up being the good guy so what a horrendous scripture and one that i struggled with even when i was a witness we now move on to Exodus, and our next Bible verse is Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. You must not make for yourself a carved image or a form like anything that is in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them, nor be enticed to serve them. For I, Jehovah your God, am a God who requires exclusive devotion, 
bringing punishment for the error of fathers upon sons, upon the third generation, and upon the fourth generation, of those who hate me, but showing loyal love to the thousandth generation, of those who love me and keep my commandments. So this is where Yahweh, or Jehovah, expresses this principle that if someone does something bad, if someone sins in some way, it's not just that person that gets punished, it's, it's his children going to the fourth generation, which I would assume to be his great-grandchildren. So, uh, kids, grandkids, and then great-grandkids. So you have a scenario in, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Mosaic Law, where a nation that was being founded on the kind of perfect morality of the supreme creator of the cosmos was coming up with the idea that you can be you can actually be punished for something that, that you haven't done not only that you haven't done but actually something that has been done by somebody who's perhaps long dead by your great grandfather or your great grandmother you can be punished for what your great grandparents did and this is supposed to be moral just imagine for a moment that we lived in a society that had a legal system based on that so that you could go to prison or you could pay some kind of fine or be perpetually in some kind of debt uh, or public service due to something that your great grandparents did just imagine that how ludicrous that would be you know we laugh at it now but that apparently was the divine standard that was the standard that in his perfect utopia on earth his chosen nation that was the standard that that God expected people to live by and it's just hideously immoral by any stretch our next verse will be Leviticus 12 verses 1 to 5 Jehovah went on to say to Moses tell the Israelites if a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a male she will be unclean for seven days, just as she is in the days of the impurity when she is menstruating. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin will be circumcised. She will continue cleansing herself from the blood for the next thirty-three days. She should not touch any holy thing, and she should not come into the holy place until she fulfills the days of her purification. If she should give birth to a female, she will then be unclean for fourteen days, just as she would be during her menstruation. She will continue cleansing herself from the blood for the next sixty-six days. Now this, for me, is fundamental sexism and misogyny. It's telling women that if they, get, that if they give birth to a boy, they're to be ritually unclean for seven days, but if, they're, if they give birth to a girl, a female, they're to be ritually unclean for double the amount of time, for 14 days. How can this be a God who acknowledges equality between men and women? Basically, um, from the moment you're born, you are judged, you are valued by this God according to how your genitalia are oriented, <laughs> according to how your plumbing works. If you have a penis, well, you know, you're off to a good start. <laughs> things, things are going well for you. Uh, if you have a vagina, well, already you're off, to, you're off on a wrong foot, because according to the Bible, according to God's inspired word, your mother has to bathe herself for twice the amount of time because she's had you, uh, a girl, a little baby girl, uh, she has to bathe herself for twice the amount of time than if you were a boy. That is fundamental sexism and misogyny and it's in the holy book. Our next scripture is Leviticus 25 verses 44 and 45. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you from them you may buy a male or a female slave. Also, from the sons of the foreign settlers who are residing with you, from them 
and from their families that are born to them in your land, you may buy slaves, and they will become your possession. So here's a hypothetical scenario, and hopefully one that isn't too blasphemous. Um, imagine you're God. <laughs> imagine you are God, and you decide to pass on your wisdom to mankind in the form of a book that will contain your ideas and basic instructions on how your creation is to behave itself and conduct itself. Um, you would think that when it comes to laying down ground rules, one of the one of the many important rules that you would set would be, please don't go around enslaving each other. Slavery is a no-no. We, we don't go there. You know, humans do not own each other. You're all free. You're all sentient beings who deserve liberty and freedom and the freedom to go where you choose and do as you choose you do not put in this book a verse that basically says actually slavery is not so bad um, the only thing I would say about slavery is don't go enslaving each other just in this chosen nation choose your slaves from outside the nation but so long as your slaves are non-Israelites, that's fine, that's good, enjoy. Which was what God was saying. Um, so we have a book that is supposed to have superior morality, superior morality to that of human beings. And it's telling us that under certain circumstances, slavery is actually okay. How can this be a morally superior book when today we have better morals than this. Today we have governments all over the world that say it is wrong to own another human being. That's something that is just not on. Our next verse is Numbers 15 verses 32 to 36. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, they found a man collecting pieces of wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him collecting wood brought him up to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly. They committed him into custody, because it had not been specified what should be done to him. And Jehovah said to Moses, The man should be put to death without fail, and the whole assembly should stone him outside the camp. So the whole assembly brought him outside the camp and stoned him so that he died, just as Jehovah had commanded Moses. This is actually one verse that I did genuinely struggle with when I was a witness because it would be read occasionally at meetings and you know for whatever reason maybe we were doing that particular verse as our Bible reading. I would really struggle with the, this idea that somebody can be worthy of death simply for collecting wood on the wrong day. And the justification that was always brought up was, oh, well, this was the Sabbath. The Sabbath was to be kept holy. You weren't to do mundane things. You weren't to work in any way on the Sabbath. Well, okay, I, I get that you have arbitrarily defined a given day as being um, a, a, like a public holiday, a, a day that's that, where you're commanded not to work. I get that. But how can the punishment for breaching the Sabbath be death? How, how can death be a justifiable punishment for somebody breaching the Sabbath? Because what you've just done there is, you've done something to somebody that is infinitely worse than what you were telling people not to do in the first place. How, how can it be better to kill someone than to collect wood on a given day? So again, the morality and ethics in a book that is supposed to have been written by the supreme creator of the cosmos who has ways and ways of thinking that are infinitely higher than those of us humans again his laws and his his commands and his rules fall infinitely short of what we would expect in society today we're staying in numbers for our next verse which is numbers 31 verses 13 to 18 then Moses and Eleazar the priest, and all the chieftains of the assembly, went out to meet them outside the camp. But Moses grew indignant at the appointed men of the combat forces, 
the chiefs of the thousands and the chiefs of the hundreds who were coming in from the military expedition. Moses said to them, Have you preserved all the females alive? Look, they are the ones who by Balaam's word induced the Israelites to commit unfaithfulness toward Jehovah over the affair of Peor, so that the scourge came upon the assembly of Jehovah. Now you should kill every male among the children, and kill every woman who has had sexual relations with a man. But you may keep alive all the young girls who have not had sexual relations with a man. So I've referred to this verse a few times in some of my, my more recent videos, and I've also um, presented, if you check back, I've presented some footage of Christopher Hitchens arguing on this point because this verse is absolutely jaw-droppingly appalling uh, for two reasons. Firstly, it's basically inciting people to genocide. It's Moses telling the Israelite troops, well, he, he's, he's chastising them. He's giving them a, an ear bashing for not being sufficiently genocidal. They've left a few people alive. That, they, that should be dead. Turn around and finish them off is what Moses is effectively saying here. So he's not just uh, commanding genocide with divine backing, because this is in the Bible after all. He's not just commanding genocide. He's also making this provision that an Amalekite can live, someone who's been born an Amalekite can live so long as they have a vagina that hasn't yet been penetrated, to put it crudely, so long as they're a virgin. Anyone else, if it's a if it's a young if if it's a teenage girl or a woman, and they and they've had sex, no, they need to die because they've had sex. What we want are the virgins. So babies, uh, young boys, uh, men, women, old people, everyone. Everyone must die if they're an Amalekite, so long as they don't have a vagina that has not had intercourse, is basically what Moses is saying. Now, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, or if you're a Jew, and you're watching this, you can, if you want to, jump through all sorts of hoops to try and explain this, but I don't think it needs any explaining. It's fairly obvious why these male soldiers were being told to kill everybody but keep the virgins. And in all of the other Bibles, you, you won't have noticed it in this Bible, but I, I pointed out in a recent video how if you go to any of the other Bible translations and you look up this verse, it says, keep the virgins for yourselves. For yourselves, as your property, in other words. Um, the New World Translation uh, softens it and, and leaves out the for yourselves part, part. So it basically says, keep them alive, keep the virgins alive, let them go free. Let this little girl who's just had her, her parents slaughtered and her brother slaughtered, uh, and her, you know, let, let her wander off into the desert free, apparently, is what this verse is saying. No, 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 I think we all know. Um, why they were allowed to live uh, and it's a grotesque verse and anybody who's telling me that the Bible is morally superior to me when it has this kind of verse in it I think I can tell them where to go our next verse is 2nd Samuel 6 verses 6 to 7 but when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon Uzzah thrust his hand out to the ark of the true God and grabbed hold of it for the cattle nearly upset it. At that Jehovah's anger blazed against Uzzah, and the true God struck him down there for his irreverent act, and he died there beside the ark of the true God. Now, I'm still not entirely sure what happened in this part of the video, but it seems that while filming on the beach, I misread my notes and forgot to comment on this verse, even though it was among the 10 I selected. So please forgive the oversight. Suffice to say, an on-the-spot execution for trying to prevent a priceless religious artifact from being damaged is hardly the sort of thing a just, loving God would do. 
Yahweh was here executing a man simply for trying to be helpful. Again, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. And if Uzzah was somehow deserving of death for his irreverent act, then the same punishment should have been meted out against David, since it was David who ordered the ark to be transported by cattle cart against the instructions of Yahweh, who prescribed in Exodus 25.14 that the ark was to be carried using poles on the shoulders of the priests. Apparently it was one rule for poor Uzzah, another for the king of Israel. Our next verse is 2 Samuel 12, verses 13 to 18. David then said to Nathan, I have sinned against Jehovah. Nathan replied to David, Jehovah in turn forgives your sin, you will not die. Nevertheless, because you have treated Jehovah with utter disrespect in this matter, the son just born to you will certainly die. Then Nathan went to his own house, and Jehovah struck the child whom Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became sick. David pleaded with the true God in behalf of the boy. David went on a strict fast, and would go in and spend the night lying on the ground. So the elders of his house stood over him, and tried to raise him up from the ground, but he refused, and would not eat with them. On the seventh day the child died, but David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. They said, While the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. So how can we tell him that the child has died? He may do something terrible. So this is the verse where God commands that one of the punishments for David's um, adulterous, uh, murderous plot with Bathsheba, one of the punishments is that the baby that resulted from that relationship must die. And the Bible is fairly explicit in saying, look, the baby died because God wanted it dead. It was one of the punishments, one of David's punishments. God thinks that the correct way to forgive somebody is to kill a baby. And <laughs> if you're a believer, if you are a Christian or a Jew or someone who thinks that, that the Bible has any kind of moral value, you have to explain how that is possible, how it is possible for the death of a baby to be appropriate punishment for, for what someone else has done. Let's recap. David arranged the death of one of his soldiers so that he could cover up his adulterous affair with that soldier's wife. And apparently that Doing all of that is not as bad as killing a baby. I would say that killing a baby is worse. Because okay, this soldier died because of what David did uh, and had his wife taken. But at least the soldier had a bit of life. You know, the baby had his life taken from him. The baby didn't get to live to be old enough to be a soldier. So I would argue that killing the baby is worse than what David did. So again, a very, very troubling Bible verse that you have to explain if you want to tell me that the God of the Bible has superior morals to me. Our next scripture is 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. He went up from there to Bethel. As he was going along the way, some young boys came out from the city and began to jeer at him. And they kept saying to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Finally, he turned around and looked at them and cursed them in the name of Jehovah. Then two she-bears came out of the forest and tore forty-two of the children to pieces. So here the prophet Elisha gets taunted by some kids for being bald. Hopefully we can all remember being kids and making fun of other kids or even adults. This is the sort of thing kids do all the time. They make fun of each other and they make fun of adults. And yes, it's irritating. It would be better if they just got on and or showed respect for adults. But that's just not the way it works. Kids do do stuff like this. But according to Yahweh, a suitable punishment for these kids calling one of his prophets a bald head was to send two bears to massacre 42 of them. 
in what I would assume was a very painful way. I, I, I would assume it's not fun to be mauled by a bear. This, again, is the sort of insane Bible verse that you have to justify if you want to suggest that the God of the Bible is morally superior. Once again, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. The final verse I've chosen is Psalm 137, verses 8 and 9. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who is soon to be devastated, happy will be the one who rewards you with the treatment you inflicted on us. Happy will be the one who seizes your children and dashes them against the rocks. Now, okay, you might be saying at this point, well, this is a poem. It wasn't necessarily to be taken literally. They weren't literally to be happy when they were dashing Babylonian children against rocks. Um, you can say that, you can say that it's just poetry, but I would argue that if this, again, is a book that's been written by a morally superior creator, uh, you, <laughs> there are much better things and much more useful things you could be putting in that book than a poem that says, uh, you'll be happy when you're killing kids. You'll be happy when you're murdering babies. I can think of much more productive things to be putting in my message to humanity, if I were the creator, than that kind of horrendous uh, language. So all of these verses in different ways have been shocking. This, one's, for, this one for me is an interesting opening into the mind of the God of the Bible because he is a God who has no qualms at all with killing babies, as we saw with the verse about David and Bathsheba. And again, anybody who tells me that this God who, who sanctioned this, not that I believe he exists by the way, but anyone who tells me that, that this kind of material is better than my morals, I'm sorry, they clearly haven't thought things through is the only polite way I can put it. So again, there were more scriptures I could have chosen. These for me were probably my top 10. Maybe a year from now or a few years from now, my top 10 will be different. But one of the reasons I thought it would be interesting to choose these scriptures would be to memorize them for when I'm talking to um, believers, particularly believers who are trying to convince me. Uh, I'm not so much interested in proselytizing my atheism, you know, it really makes no difference to me whether someone is religious or not. There is no atheist hell for, for believers to go to. It really honestly makes no difference to me. Um, but it's slightly different if somebody is approaching me um, with the aim of converting me. And what, one thing that kind of prompted me to make this video and to research these verses was when I watched some footage from the Reason Rally, and the Reason Rally is like a secular, uh, atheistic um, rally that happens in Washington. I don't know whether it's every year or every few years, but there was definitely one this year. And I watched the videos from it. There's a few videos that have gone up on YouTube from people who attended. One of the things I noticed was that there were, <laughs> there were religious people there who were trying to convert the atheists and the religious people were, were carrying Bibles, you know, and it was almost like they were kind of, it was like some magic token for them. And you can, I can remember what it was like when I was a witness, you felt as though the Bible was your kind of sword of the spirit. It was, it was like a talisman that, that would kind of protect you from the heathens and would give you the wisdom to, to teach. And you could see the same kind of fervor and zeal in these guys that were at the Reason Rally and um, one of the uh, atheists who I subscribed to actually went up to one of them and started reasoning with them and was saying things like, oh well, um, you do realise that you can't prove the authorship of this book, um, you there is simply no way of establishing, first of all, the, hist the historicity of most of what it's talking about, but also who's written it and whether it's been edited or, edited or not, you have no way of of assuring anyone of that and I thought that was a good line a good line to take but I also was thinking how would I approach that scenario and I thought wouldn't it be pretty amazing if you could actually memorize 10 
verses that that you can just read one after the other and not even say much you could just read the verses just say listen you know I, I promise you I'm not going to do anything um, upsetting do you mind if I borrow your Bible and read you for a, few, a few verses now if you're a Jehovah's Witness in that situation you're going to say well yes of course you know read, read me what you want um, and I would read those verses back to back with as little commentary as possible maybe just a quick glance to say do you have anything to say about that okay well let's read the next verse boom 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 read ten verses and and then just kind of stand back and say and, and you think that I can learn from this kind of morality even if I give you uh, even if I give it to you that this book was written by God which I don't personally believe but let's put that to one side and let's take your argument at face value that this book is written by the creator of the cosmos and that I must orient my life according to the wisdom found in this book how on earth do you justify these verses and how on earth do you tell me that this is the sort of thinking I should have in my life this is the sort of wisdom that is advisable for the whole human race to have how do you justify it and if I were a Jehovah's Witness presented with that that would be <laughs> I don't think there is such I don't think that there is such thing as a silver bullet for breaking indoctrination but that, that would be a, a, a pretty big you know slap in the face but a slap of a slap in the face with reason and with logic and something that they could maybe take home and think about so um, that's what prompted me to make this video and that's what prompted me to research these verses I haven't yet memorized them I have to confess but that's maybe something I can do over the next few uh, months or years I don't know hopefully it won't be that hard maybe if you want to try it um, let me know what your results are in the comments below or what you think about these verses, what you think about this technique. Maybe there are verses that you think should be in the tent that weren't in the tent. By all means, let me know what those verses were. Or, you know, if you're a believer, by all means, give us your arguments for why these verses are okay. Um, but good luck with that. <laughs> I think you'll struggle. Um, and yeah, th that's why, I think in a nutshell, this is, this is the argument for me why why I am an atheist because even if you I, I like I like forms of argumentation where you can say to someone even if I give you all of this that you're telling me what about this and this is one of those arguments where um, you know how on earth can you justify that kind of morality and if you if you just read maybe one or two verses on their own it may be might leave someone oh that that doesn't sit right with me or you maybe you've got a point there um, and they might even try and reason with it but if you hit them with 10 <laughs> that are all terrible that are all objectionable and, and disgusting I, I really do think that that's very compelling and I'm interested to see what results I have with that approach I wouldn't consider it an aggressive approach I wouldn't consider it a confrontational approach. It could be aggressive or confrontational depending on how you read the verses, but if you just read them in, well, you know, what do you have to say about that? Are you honestly telling me that this is how I should view things? I think it can be done in, in, in a way that is very non-confrontational and just purely appealing to logic and reason. So, I thought I'd take the time to make a couple of videos that weren't too taxing on me intellectually and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you for watching. <laughs>